Tell you what, I love, I love, I love, I love being in the presence of the Lord and also in the presence of his people. Um, There's just a match that I think might have been made in heaven. What do you think? Amen. You know, one of the things that we value very, very heavily here is not just in doing ministry, but in doing ministry together as a people. God didn't call us to do life and to do ministry alone, but he called us together. That's why we are called the people of God. Amen? Not just the person of God. I had a friend say to me one time, they said, all I need is God and me. And I said, that's funny because God said it wasn't good. Had a perfect Adam in a perfect garden, no sin, perfect relationship. And God says, not good. We're designed to be together. And one of the questions that we are always asking, Jesus said, go into all the world. Nope, wrong verse. Back up. He said in Matthew, (laughs) he said this, he says, let your light shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your father that is in heaven. And so one of the questions we ask here a lot is, how are we doing that as a church? You know, back in 2017, we had a a ministry that birthed out of here called Foster Florida, um, where there was just a great concern over the, the foster care situation and the lack of fostering that was happening in our own community. But then once we took a look at that, we realized that there was a a lot of parents that were in the foster care system that needed help and needed assistance. And so Foster Florida was birthed out of that. And then very soon after that, um, we began to um, just God continued to move some things in our hearts. And, And one of the things that came out of that was a day that we that was called the Foster Family Fun Day at the farm say that three times fast and um, it was just an opportunity for for these kids that are in the foster care system their lives have been upended their lives have been turned upside down and and it's a day for them to be able to gather and just forget about the world for just a day and to have some fun and and for the parents that are caring for those children to have a break and to to have uh, community and so I want to encourage you mark your calendar for March 2nd um, because we're going to be having, in fact, is, is Miss Arlene here? There you are. Miss Arlene, would you, I, I mean, she's going to hate that I do this. Would you stand, please? This has been the, the dream and the vision of, um, of Rod and Arlene. Rod is one of our new elders um, here at TFC. And it's just really um, important that we put feet to our faith. Amen. And so I want to encourage you this morning, even right now, um, Seth talked about our, our connect cards. Um, I want to encourage you. We need help as a church. We need to jump in. We need to dive in to help make this a success and to let our light shine. And so you can be seated, Arlene. Thank you. Um, and so I want to ask you to fill out a connect card and just simply on the back of the card, put foster, just, just put foster. All right. And we'll know exactly what that is. Um, You can also, you can find Arlene hopefully in the lobby afterwards to be able to explain some more about what that is. And we're going to be talking about this each week for a while because we believe that we're called to be light. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you guys brought a Bible? I should say brought a smartphone. That's just how we do that right now, right? Um, We have been in, in the series this week about prayer, laying a foundation of Prayer and our and our foundational verse was in Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, and it says this: If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And the question that we've been asking. Um, this entire month is, will we be that people? And I am glad to report this past Wednesday, our elders and our pastors and, and our staff and many um, of our leaders and, 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 and some of you, we gathered together, together as a church to answer that question. And we answered it with a resounding, yes, we will be your people. Yes, we will humble ourselves. Um, in fact, uh, and we will pray. In fact, beginning this morning, 
Um, two of our, our, our uh, family here has resurrected and reopened our morning intercessory prayer. And, um, and so every Sunday morning from 930 to 10, our prayer room is open for the express purpose of praying for what God is going to be doing here each week that we gather. So we're excited about that. If you want to find out more about that, on that same Connect card, prayer, you can have a list, foster, prayer. It's going to keep getting, getting longer and longer. But uh, we're, we're excited about that. So yes, we will humble ourselves. We will remember that we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to always come at, at everything that we deal with saying we only know the things we know. We only know in part. We only see in part. And we need God's help working through us. Um, here's what I love, though, because when we got done with the prayer thing, because we've been reading Second Chronicles 714. But let me read to you God's response in 715. It says, if you will humble yourself, you will pray. You will turn, uh, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways. Listen to this. He says, now. Somebody say now. My eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Oh, that's not to soak in for some of y'all. I have chosen and consecrated my temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. And I don't know about you, but I like having the confidence of knowing that wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, God's got his eye on me. How about you? Amen. So many of us, we've also, we've just completed the 21 days. Um, Today is day 21, unless you started on a Tuesday or missed a day or three. Um, But we're getting close to the end of that. And I hope that that devotional, that 21 days of prayer has been um, really beneficial and has helped you. It's been very helpful for me. Today, we are going to close out our series and close out the month. Um, as we're talking about prayer. And we're going to talk about and take a look at the house that God builds. How many of you know that God is building his house? How many of you are glad to be part of the construction project? Amen. So we're going to take a look at that and we're going we're to answer a few questions. What does that look like? What is God building? What is our next step? Isn't it great? God's building a house. Now what do I do? Right? Psalm 127 says this, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. How many of you, that seems a little weird. You're like, wait a minute, are we building the house or is God building the house? And like, how does that work? Has anybody else ever wondered about that? Nobody. Great. We'll move on. (laughs) Just kidding. No, the reality is, you know, if you think of it as, you know, I have a friend of mine who had his house built by, by one of the major contractors, um, here, I'm, I'm, Sure, he wouldn't mind if I if I said his name. It's GW um, Builders. He's he's one of the few master builders in in the Gainesville area. I've known this guy since I was literally eleven years old, and um, and so he built a house for a friend of mine. Here's the funny thing: I never saw him lift a hammer, never saw him lift a hammer and nail, never saw him put beams in place, and somebody else did. Right, a bunch of people from all different walks of life that have skills in certain areas. And when it gets done, whose name gets put on the house? The builder. When we say this is whose house? God's house. And it's time for us to get to work. Amen? He's the contractor. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at an example in Scripture of God actually building his temple. Um, Now, he had built it under Solomon, and they built this glorious temple, and the the glory of God fell. In fact, the passage that we read out of 2 Chronicles, excuse me, that was at the first building of the temple. And he was saying to them, guys, if you'll do this, man, my eyes will be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. It's going to be amazing. But guess what? They didn't do it. And within a few years... The, the kingdom had been divided in two, and they were eventually conquered by the Babylonians. And they were thrown into exile, taken out of Jerusalem, the temple destroyed. But after a, a period of time, Babylon also fell, and a new king reigned over Persia. And he sent uh, or allowed them to go back to begin to build the temple and to rebuild the wall. A lot of you are familiar with the story of Nehemiah. 
But there's a book of the Bible before Nehemiah called the book of Ezra. In fact, they used to be together. It used to be one book. It was called Ezra Nehemiah and then was eventually divided into two. And while Nehemiah talks about the rebuilding of the wall, Ezra shows us a picture of the rebuilding of the temple. And so um, I told the guys not to worry about putting this on the screen. I just want you to listen as, to this as you would a story because Ezra is writing and telling us a story of something that happened. And it goes like this in chapter 3 of Ezra. He says, When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of God of Israel, to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both morning and evening sacrifices. Then, in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those as free will offerings to the Lord. Then on the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, the king of Persia. And in the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, and the rest of the people began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph and the cymbals took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, the king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was was laid. Verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard from far away. So some of you got like all your scripture reading in today for the rest of the week. But it's an incredible story because it's a story of a people who had been in captivity and, 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 and really in a lot of ways had begun to lose hope because a lot of prophets were telling them, hey, when you go into captivity, it's going to be, don't even worry about it. It's just going to be a couple of days, you know, and, and, and of course, Jeremiah said, no, actually, guys, it's going to be 70 years, maybe a little longer. Um, and how many of you know that everybody loves to be prophesied over to get the new house and the new job, but nobody wants to hear the prophet say, no, you're going to be in it for longer than you'd like. And, and, but so now they're coming out of this season, but there's a couple of things that we want to take a look at because I think they apply to us here at the family church in 2024. And the first thing um, that we see as he's building the house and what kind of house is it going to be? is first of all, it's a house of worship. It's going to be a house of worship. And before anything else was laid, they began to lay that foundation of worship. In verse 2, it says, Then Joshua, the son of Josadak, and the priests, it says they began to build the altar of God. And I love what it says there, in accordance to what was written in the law of Moses. This is going to be a house, folks. This is going to be a house where we're going to worship the king. We're going to worship Jesus, but not according to our preference, according to his word. 
Time and time again in this story, you said, according to Moses, according to what is written, according to whatever. You know, some of you wonder, why do we make so much noise? Why do we shout the way that we do? Why do we raise our hands? Because Scripture tells us to come that way. Scripture says, come into his presence with thanksgiving. It tells us to come with shouts of joy. Because I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't feel like shouting. Sometimes I don't feel like praising. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough weekend, and people didn't behave according to my will, right? And so I'm not happy. But when I come into the presence of God, he, I come according to his way. I come according to his will, and, and we celebrate the goodness of God. We pray. Sometimes I don't feel like praying. But Jesus said, pray, lest you fall into temptation. What does that mean? If I don't pray, I will fall into temptation. So I pray sometimes because I love to pray, and then sometimes I pray because I better pray. But both can serve us. Amen? Verse 6 says this, on the seventh day of the month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple has not yet been laid. There's, there's all kinds of things that we can do as a church. There's all kinds of systems and things that we can put in place that will give us the appearance of success, but God is not in it. In fact, the worst possible outcome for us as a church is that we succeed without his presence. We have to be a people that are committed to prayer, that are committed not just to praying, but to consecrating our lives and living our lives in such a way that brings honor to God so that when the work begins... His blessing is on it. How many of you want his blessing on our work? Amen. So the first thing, we've got to make sure that we're going to be a house of worship. Number two, in verse seven, it says this. They gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. Here's the second thing. It's going to require money. And I know churches and ministries over the years have gotten a bad rap because of how they have abused the funds of God. And they will answer to God for that. But the reality is, is no ministry happens without money. It takes money to do ministry. And, and, and while we can't ever put a dollar figure on the souls or on transformation of the human heart, I just wanted to share a few things with you. Three weeks into 2024, we've already seen seven people giving their lives to Jesus. Last week, we baptized a different seven people just this past weekend. In our community, we've helped feed hundreds on top of hundreds of families in our community that are struggling with food insecurity. Our kid-to-kid closet They're providing clothing and supplies for multiple hundreds of people. I wish you could see what our what our what our our uh, reception area looks like on a Monday morning. We got them this 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 uh, cart, big old cart. We said, you know, we can get all the stuff in there and we'll wheel it back into the back, and then we come in on Monday and it's like, ladies, am I telling the truth? It's filled up like this, and then our reception area looks like a storage facility. You can't hardly get around. We've, you've got to kind of maze your way through to get in because it is just so resonating in the hearts of people. And guys, it's only the tip of the iceberg. We believe that God is calling us to do even more, to partner with others, to let our light shine in the community. But guess what? It takes money. It takes resources to do that. And so, uh, and so, um, I'm backing up here. Yeah, we are getting ready to to launch a few other things, a few other tools and a few other systems and things that we're getting ready to go in that I wish I could tell you about right now, but you're going to have to hang on till next Sunday. (laughs) So it's going to require that we maintain a heart and and a place of worship. It's going to require money to accomplish and to build the house of God. Here's the third thing. It's going to require everyone to do their part. In verse 8, it says this, In the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Josadak, and the rest of the people began the work. 
How many of y'all are ready to begin the work? All three of you, hallelujah. <laughs> y'all realize that the Hebrew for everyone actually means everyone. I can give it to you in Greek too if you want. We need everybody, everybody operating in their God-given gifts and in their talents and their abilities to see the work of God go forth. I know traditionally in a lot of people, uh, in a lot of churches, we have this idea, well, that's why we hired staff. We pay you and you go do the work of ministry. But Ephesians chapter 4 tells us this. It says, for he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for works of service. That word service is the Greek word that is also translated ministry. And it says, until we all, somebody say all, All. the Greek word translated there means all, all. (laughs) come to the unity of the faith and the fullness of the Son of God. That means that we're walking together as one and we look like Jesus. How many of you are glad that he's committed to the end of the process? So we need people to rise up. Men, we need you to rise up. All right, I'm just going to say this out loud. It's going to be on tape. Forgive me. They're making us look real bad right now. <laughs> but you know what? We, we suffer as men. We suffer in silence. We walk through our situations, and it's, it's not manly to acknowledge that we have need. And we, we need to create a safe Space and it's going to take men rising up. Um, we, we need people to rise up to begin to pour into our next generation. I don't know whether you figured it out or not, but in a few years, ain't none of us going to be here. I said that to my wife one day. She said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> We're walking through a hospital. I said, honey, you realize in a hundred years, nobody's going to be here. Not the babies, nobody. She says, you have issues. But it's always a, rem- it's a reminder to teach us to number our days. And there are things that God has placed in you, experiences and things that you've experienced and gone through and that God has brought you through that's not just for you. It's for another generation. We need people in our children's ministry. I know sometimes we think that children's ministry exists as a babysitting service while we come over here and do church. But there's incredible ministry happening with our children. Many of you, the first time you heard about Jesus was from a children's church worker. And so we need people to rise up. Our youth, I don't know whether you figured it out yet or not, but they said, is it Gen Alpha or Gen Z? One of them, they will outnumber the baby boomers. All right. So let me tell you what that means. In a few years, the world will look like them, not like us. You have an opportunity to speak in now because tomorrow will be too late. So we need people to rise up in that. Listen, um, one of the things we're getting ready to do here in the first of March is we're getting ready to launch as a church what's called our Discover class. And it's going to be a three-week environment where we're going to encourage you to come in. We want you to know our story. We want to see how your story intersects with our story. We want you to understand our vision and our mission and our strategy. We want you to understand um, um, how we do membership. How How do we function as a church? And then what we want to do is we want to bring you in and help you to discover your God-given design. How many of you know that God has made you like no one else? You are unique. But God wants to take your uniqueness and bring it together with other uniqueness to form something that our community has not yet seen. And so we're going to dive in and discover what's your unique gift, what's your unique skill. And then in that third week, we're going to get back together and we're going to say, now, how do we launch you? How do we launch you into your God-given purpose? How many of you are ready to live a life with purpose? So be, be on the lookout for that and see that that's coming. So, so when we look at this story, what do we see again? We've got to be a house of prayer. We've got to be a house of worship, a house that, 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 that loves God according to the scripture. It's going to require money. We've got to be a people who give and give faithfully and sometimes sacrificially not so that we can do pretty things, but so that we can serve our city well. Amen? And that it's going to require everyone. Whose job is it to see the kingdom of God move forward? 
Say it this way, it's my job. It's my job. And uh, because when it's every when everybody's supposed to do it, you know how many people do it? Nobody. (laughs) But when we begin to internalize that and make it make it ours, Um, the third thing, and this is important, in verse twelve, it says this: When many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple, they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being built. And um, it's easy to think that they saw it and they were just overwhelmed with joy that God is finally going to, we're going to finally have the temple rebuilt, but that is not why they were weeping. And I'll show you that in just a moment. They were weeping because when they finally saw the outline and the foundation of the temple, it didn't look like the last one. And what you need to understand is that God is wanting to do a new thing in our city, a new thing in our community. This is the young people, because they never, they didn't know, know what the old one looked like. So they're like, yeah, let's go, fire, let's go. The ones who saw the last one, they went, mm. we didn't sing it that way when I was there. It didn't look that way when I was there. In fact, the greatest hindrance to today's move of God is actually yesterday's move of God. Because when I got saved, we sang it a certain way. We dressed a certain way. They preached it a certain way. And it was meaningful and it was real. And God did an incredible thing in my life. But then what happened is I began to attach myself to the method. And I began to believe that this is the only way that God does it. And if he doesn't do it that way, maybe that's not really quite God. I I shared with with Pastor Philip a few years ago. I said, I'm going to know when the next great move in worship happens. He goes, really, how will you know? I said, I'm going to hate it. (laughs) Jesus said this. He said, no one takes a new piece of cloth and attaches it to an old piece of cloth because it'll tear away and ruin the entire garment. He says, no one takes new wine and pours it into old wineskins because it'll ruin the wineskin and both the wine and the wineskin will be lost. And then he goes on and says this, no one who has tasted the old wine prefers the new for they say the old is better. So can we just all just admit that right now and get that off the table? The way we used to do things was better. Doesn't that feel good? (laughs) So we don't have to argue about that anymore, right? It was better. But God is wanting to do something new. Listen to what God said to the same group of people, because Ezra is not a prophetic book. Ezra is just a book that's telling you it's chronicling. Ezra is a scribe, and he's just writing down what happened. But Haggai is a prophet. And Haggai said this to this same group of people. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? Who of you remembers the revival of the 80s and the 70s? How many of you remember the healing revivals of the 50s? Who of you is here that remembers that? Does it, how does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord. He goes on to say in that same passage, he says, the glory of the latter house will be greater. Somebody say greater. Than the glory of the former house. But if we're going to see that happen, we've got to be willing to let go of what was, to lay hold of what God has before us, always according to the scriptures. Okay? We don't do new just for new sake. There was a time my dad and I were watching a, a video of this person who was doing this thing online, and, and he said, I just can't get into that style of thing. And I said, man, you'd have hated Martin Luther's church. Martin Luther, for those of you who don't know, he was 
universally called the father of the Reformation. But one of the things that he did as he came out is he, you know, how many of you that have been in the church a while, you've heard the song, A mighty fortress is our God. That is like, that's, that's one of the oldies, man. That's like, nothing speaks of God. Kind of like that song, right? He got it from a song that they used to sing that was a very common song that they sang in the pubs. Just change the words. Those of you that don't like that, you'd have hated his church. <laughs> you know, but what time does is time changes our views, doesn't it? And we tend to remember back things with a different set of things. But what God, why does God do that? Because God wants you following him, not a system. Because systems are, fun, are great. Man wants a formula, but God wants a relationship. And so it requires us to always have our, 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 our head on that. And by the way, Haggai was not rebuking them. Haggai was encouraging them. Like, guys, I know it doesn't look like anything. I, I know. And Jesus was encouraging them. Yeah, the old is better. But, man, we're going to do something new. And something new is going to spring up. And God says this. He says, don't you recognize it? Don't you see it? Don't you see what God wants to do? Because if we're going to see God do new things in new ways, we've got to be willing to do things we've never done before. Somebody say, I ain't scared. Because <laughs> God is with us. So, but why is he doing this? Why is God building all of these things together and, and doing this work? Of, is it just so that people can stand around and look at it and go, ooh? Is it so that we can, as we talked about a few weeks ago, make a name for ourselves? No. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 56. Verses 4 through 7. We're going to close here. The other scripture that we referred to was in this very chapter of Isaiah where he said, My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. But I wanted to read to you some of the verses before that. Because this is what I believe God is doing in our house right now. In verse 4, it says, For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Why is it important? Why is he talking to the eunuchs in particular? Because number one, eunuchs, according to the law of Moses, were cut off from their people. They were, they were not even to be a part named in the people of Israel. He was talking to a people that had no future. They had no progeny. When they're done, their, their line of their lineage ends. And God says, to you that have no future, to you that feel like this is the end of the line, for you that feel like, hey, it really doesn't matter where I go because my, my whole existence is just about waking up and eating and doing a job and going to bed, rinse and repeat. To you, I'm giving you a purpose and a hope, and I'm giving you a name that is better than sons and daughters. Let that soak in for a minute. Better than sons and daughters. And then he goes on in verse 6 and says, and to the foreigners. Any foreigners here? If you're not Jewish, you are a foreigner. Thank you, God that you chose to reach out to the foreigner. Amen? Amen. Who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant. Listen to this. I will bring you to my holy mountain and I will give you joy. Is there anybody else in here that could use a good dose of joy? All you got to do is spend three minutes on social media, two minutes on the news, and there just ain't a whole lot to be joyful about. But he says to you who are foreigners, man, I'm going to bring you in and I'm going to gather you together and I and you're going to have joy in my house of prayer. Your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, the things that you bring to God, he will accept on his altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all 
nations. Did you guys just hear that? The house that we're building is not for us. And what I mean is we church folk. It's for the foreigner. It's for the person that is still far from God. It is for the person that is still asking the questions, is anybody out there who gives a you-know-what about anything? Is there anyone out there that can see me as I am and still love me back to Jesus? Is there somebody, is there anybody out there that will stop pointing the finger and will start pointing the finger? Is there any place like that? My house, he said, will be called a house of prayer for everyone. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11 to those who were still afar off. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Is there anyone here that's needing rest? Because you know what? Life can be burdensome. It's hard having to live up to everyone else's expectations. It's hard having to do things that, that, that I believe people want me to be and want me to do. It, 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 it's tiresome to have to put in all of these hours on your job only to not be appreciated and not to feel loved or to be discarded. It's hard to be in a relationship that you thought was going to be forever. You thought the relationship was a 10 and the other person thought it was a 2. And they decided that they could find a 10 somewhere else. It's hard. He said, come to me. I'll give you rest from all of that. Take my yoke upon you. Let me say this. Yoke means work, right? Right? And in that day, the yoke was the teaching of the rabbi. It says, take my teaching on you. But a yoke, you put on a yoke because you're getting ready to work. You don't just put on a yoke. It's not a fashion statement. It's work. But he says, take it on you. Learn from me because I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. Y'all don't think Jesus was humble? If I was on that cross... The moment they said, if you are, you would all be done. If I knew what I had, the power that I had, and you're still talking trash while I'm trying to give my life for you, I love y'all, but I don't love y'all that much. But he was humble. The Bible says, even an obedient, even unto death. He says, come to me, you will find rest for your souls. Folks, I don't know about you, but I am tired of trying to figure out how to do things my way. And and the sneaky thing about it is that sometimes it works out. It's kind of like going to the golf course and playing around the golf and I can't find the stupid fairway to save my life. And just about the moment I say, I ain't ever doing this again. I hit that one shot. Maybe there's hope. It's fun on a golf course. It's not fun in life. Lord Jesus, I'll do it your way. I'll do it your way. No, actually, on that one time I do it my way, it works. And then I fall back into the same old trap. And he says, listen, let's get out of the cycle. Let's get out of the cycle. Come, find rest in the house of God. And you may be here this morning and you may be listening online God is wanting to build a place where he can live. God is wanting to build a place where his presence is not only talked about, but known and experienced. God wants to build a place, not just in a church, but in your home. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone answers, I like to say, I'm anyone. I will come in and I will eat with him. And he will eat with me. And the way into that is simply this. It's simply to accept the gift that God has given to us by his son. See, Jesus came to receive a kingdom, but he also came to pay a price for our souls that we couldn't pay for ourselves. And he said, listen, 
I'm going to come. I'm going to do the hard work. I'm going to repair the breach that was created between God and between us. And all I need you to do is accept that gift. B, believe that God raised this same Jesus from the dead, seated him with him. And and I'll add to this for those of you that aren't church people. When he rose from the dead, he was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses. So it wasn't a one-off. It wasn't just a few guys that said it happened. Over 500 people saw him, interacted with him over the course of uh, a month and a half after he rose from the dead. But if you will believe that and then see, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord. Your relationship with him begins now. And we want to pray with you. We want, to, we want to invite you and show you what it is to begin to walk, not just with Jesus, but with family. Because God sets the lonely in family. How many of you are so glad that he's placed the lonely in family? And so we're not going to belabor this point. In fact, I want to invite all of you to stand and invite um, the elders and pastors that are here. If you guys will make your way to the front. God wants to build a place that he can live in so that those that are out there will see that city that is on a hill. That they will find a place of refuge. But what it's going to take for you, church, for me, church, is that we together say we will be that people. Church, will you be that people? Will you be that people? Then let's get to work. I want to pray for you. Um, If you today made that decision and said, I'm ready to follow Jesus. On the same card that's here, our connect card. Would love if you would just fill that out and check on that box. It says, listen, my decision today is to follow Jesus for the first time. Because we want to walk with you. We want to show you what's next. We're not perfect. We're just a little farther down the road than you are. And it's better to learn. You know, I learned this a long time ago that experience is not the best teacher. Someone else's experience is a much better teacher because you get to learn all the good stuff without walking through the pain. And I do not like pain. But let me pray for you this morning. And then we're going to dismiss. If you came here this morning and you still need somebody to pray with you personally, this is why these these folks are here. They want to pray with you. These are men and women of faith. If you're not sure if you can touch the hem of his garment, I know these guys can. So make your way there and we'd love to pray with you. Let's pray. Father, this day, we as a people have answered the question, yes, we will be that people. So Lord, I pray for grace for every person that is here. Lord, that you would give every one of us oil for the journey. Because, Lord, it is not a sprint. It is a long race. Lord, teach us to be faithful, to hand off what needs to be handed off. Lord, to to lay aside the weights that are so uh, encumbering us so that we can run free to accomplish your purpose in our generation. Lord, because we believe that there are people who still have not heard, still have not seen, still have not experienced just how good you are. So Lord, live here. Live in us. Reprove us when we need to be reproved. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Teach us how to be a community of people who look like your son, who love like your son. Teach us to be a people who love your presence more than we love the presence or the gifts that you give. And Lord, I pray that as we walk out of this place this morning, that our hearts would ignite once again for you and for your purpose in our generation. Teach us to be a people who receive from you and then quickly hand off to others so that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, as we go throughout this week, we trust you. 
We love you. We look with great anticipation at what you are doing and what you are going to do in our homes, in our lives, in our families, in this community at TFC, and in the surrounding area of Alachua County and beyond. As you let your kingdom come, as you allow your will to be done in this place as it is in heaven. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. And if you're in agreement with that this morning, would you say amen? Amen and amen. Yeah, come on, let's give the Lord praise. Thank you so much for being a part, man. Our best days are ahead. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God is going to do. I want to remind you, stop by the Connect desk, see Arlene, to talk about this next initiative that we can have to help families um, in our Connect. And if you need prayer, come on forward. We'd love to pray with you. Until then, we'll see you again. God bless you.